Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. So, I, first off, I would like to apologize to people who have asked me to schedule my live streams in advance. Um, I have done that a couple of times, but lately I have been pretty much catch as catch can for when I can get online and stream versus when I have time to sit and record videos in advance. So, you know, it's gonna, and it's probably gonna be like that for at least the next month, maybe two months. So it's not something that I'm like, oh, in a couple of weeks I'll have this straightened out. Like my schedule's been pretty chaotic lately. It's a lot of stuff I'm trying to get taken care of both on the art side and on the business side of, of making comics. But I haven't done a video on figure drawing in a while. And there are definitely people on YouTube that are much better qualified to teach figure drawing than I am. However, the reason why I wanted to do this video is because I wanted to show you how I study figure drawing. That's been a big part of my growth as an artist is I take figure drawing classes on a weekly basis. And when people have asked me what's been the most important thing to help me grow as an artist, it's been two things. One is actually attending a figure drawing class on a weekly basis. Drawing from the live model will increase your understanding of the human form tremendously. And I still have much work and growth to do on it, but it's been invaluable. The second thing, which I do not do frequently enough, but I'm gonna do for you today, and what I usually do when I'm doing my fixing bad figure drawings videos, is I take some drawings from my class that did not come out well. Anatomical details are wrong, or the perspective is wrong, or it just looks wonky. And I sit down and I try to redraw the drawing not to make a better drawing, but really I'm doing a lot of sketches to deconstruct what I did wrong and what are the concepts of figure drawing and anatomy that I am getting wrong and that I don't understand. Because if you don't take the time to look at your mistakes and really analyze them, you're just gonna keep making them over and over again. Drawing on your own, you will get better, but if you actually go back and analyze your crappy work, it will help you grow. So. That's what I do here is I'm gonna take some of my figure drawing classes, figure drawing uh, sketches. And uh, usually I work with the human form, the full body, because the head, whoops, the head has a lot of detail to it, there's a lot of complexity. Um, there's a set, there's a difference between drawing the actual structure of the head versus the portrait. So since this is one that's from a rough sketch anyway, it doesn't really have a sense of portraiture to it, I'm gonna be working more on getting the sense of structure down, like particularly how I butchered the underside of the jaw, um, the sense of the cheekbones, they don't really line up, the volume of the head's a little bit off. And I'm gonna start with just some basic volumetric sketches, but then also in order to really help me with the details, I've got my old buddy, Mr. Bones here. So this one is a life-size human skull. Well, actually, you know, it's probably smaller than life size. I'd like to think, yeah, normally if you put your hand up to somebody's face, yeah, this is probably, I don't know. It's not a um, two to one scale. It's what's larger than, than a half, half size of a head, but it's definitely not a 100% full size. Um, well, actually, you know what? I'll have to check against the figure drawing skull that we have at my class. So we do have a full-size skull there. And this feels like it's about the size of a, a full-size skull. Um, I see some questions coming in the chat. So let me address those, and then we'll get into some drawing. But anyway, point is, is that I was going to start with some volumetric stuff and then actually looking at the anatomical structures on this skeleton to compare between what I did in my drawing and what I'm trying to get. So... First off in questions, I see Sonic Girl uh, 7467 chiming in. What's the difference between, between figure drawing and gesture drawing? Well, it's not so much that there are, there's a difference between them as there are two stages of the same activity. So your gesture, let me switch gears real quick and pull out a figure drawing that's in this stack so I can show you. All right, so here's a drawing of a woman with her arms reaching up towards the sky. Now the gesture of this drawing is just capturing the flow of, the, um, of what the body is doing 
and capturing the general idea of all of the, uh, the, 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 the different limbs and what they're, the parts of the body are doing. So you would start with, let's say, the spine kind of bending backwards and then out of the spine, left near the top, you would kind of say, well, about where you're gonna put the shoulders, having the arms reaching up, having one leg that's coming straight, kind of not straight down, but curving down and in a little bit, another leg that's kind of curving in the back with the foot raised. And let's say the head is tilting back here and it's kind of going behind the arm that's closest to the viewer. So once you've got the head sort of circled in there, and the arms maybe get in here and give a little bit of volume to the pelvis, but I'm already starting to get into figure drawing. In essence, a gesture drawing is really just a stick figure. This is a pretty um, broad one. Like I tend to draw with a lot of tone and broad strokes when I'm doing figure drawing, or at least I try to work that way. So this is almost like a large tonal mass, but this would be your gesture. A gesture, it's like a stick figure drawing. If I draw it again real quick, it would just be spine, pelvis, legs, arms. That's the gesture drawing. Now the figure drawing is when you combine volume like for instance, this arm that's going up. If you actually say, all right, here's a cylinder and it's going up and then it starts to turn away from you as it goes farther up and then it goes down into the shoulder. The shoulder is mostly hidden since you're seeing it from the, uh, the rib cage. Your shoulder's kind of like behind that cylinder. But then you also combine that with, let's say that there's a mass of the, uh, the triceps in the back. And then you add the anatomical detail of the elbow. Well, first, the two bones that come out at the, um, the end of the humerus, the upper body, the upper of the forearm bone, and those bones kind of cradle the end of the, um, the ulna, the, the bone of the, the main bone of the forearm, the radius kind of rotates around that, so it's the radius and the ulna. Now this is a very scrappy drawing. If I were really gonna try and draw this, I would probably go through. I'll draw this a little bit cleaner for you in a sec because drawing it while speaking is using up some of my brain power that would hopefully make this a better drawing. But figure drawing is when you combine Figure equals gesture plus volume plus anatomy. See, I can't even write straight when I'm talking. So if I were to go in and flesh this drawing out more, I'll try to do it quickly, but um, I'm going to kind of combine the anatomical with the volumetric structures at the same time. But going in here and drawing in the rib cage, the pelvis, one leg. The lower leg, the foot resting on the ground, this leg going back a little bit, the buttocks behind it, this leg coming down, the lower leg, foot coming down to touch the ground. They're on their tippy toes. And if uh, the volume gets too low and you can't quite hear me, please let me know in the chat because occasionally when I'm looking away, I'm looking down at the drawing table, I'm using my, uh, 
my phone to record. So sometimes if I get a little bit too far up from the speaker, the sound gets a little muffled and muddled. So just let me know and I will pipe up and, uh, and try to keep my head a little bit closer to the, uh, the camera. This is an area that I personally always have trouble with. So this is one of those areas that I, as an artist, need to study more, which is how the collarbone goes up, but then the muscles of the pectoralis also go up and they wrap around the upper arm. Yeah, this one, I'm just gonna keep it kind of simple. The way the shoulder's sort of trapped on one side by the pecs, on the other side by the latissimus dorsi. And now looking at this, I very much feel like it's out of proportion in the sense that the, uh, the proportion of the uh, upper torso is out of whack with the, uh, the lower torso. Let's see if the head is up here and that's the midway point of the figure. You go down about the same distance, yeah. So look at how much shorter this figure is. Like this leg should be at least down to here. The knee should be down to there. That's one of the things that, this is the reason why I do a lot of these studies is to look at mistakes that I make. And like I said, there's people that are definitely more qualified to teach anatomy on YouTube that are putting out great content. Um, my whole goal here is to share with you the way that I study to try and improve my anatomy because my video is more focused on being comic book centric, you know, writing and drawing comic books but, you know, figure drawing is important to that. If you're um, trying to tell realistic, uh, using, trying to use realistic figures in your storytelling. So that is the difference between gesture drawing and figure drawing. So let's see. Oh, okay, more questions. Um, know any great model tools for people without life drawing classes? Um, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. If you do a search on YouTube for, I believe it's Crocus Cafe. Or if you just do a search for figure drawing, um, figure drawing models on YouTube. But if you look up Crocus Cafe, I might have switched the, uh, the U and the I. But um, point being, if you do a search for this, it's a YouTube channel where they have some poses of figures and they're time poses. So they have models that take up, that are, it's still photos. You're just watching a slideshow of still photos, but they're of figure drawing models in different poses. And if it's a five minute pose, then the, the video runs for five minutes and then you get a new image, a new pose. It is not a substitute for figure drawing models. There's nothing in the world like actually getting a good model in front of you and being in a class. But if you can't afford a class or there aren't any near you, then it's at least something that you can work with. So that's a resource, resource is looking online. Um, there's also some online schools. Like I know Schoolism, um, New Masters Academy. I think that they have some figure drawing classes online that you can take so you actually do guided, instructed figure drawing classes. Um, Schoolism, I think, is a lot more about concept design and illustration and storytelling. So I don't know if they have figure drawing, but New Masters Academy, um, I'm pretty sure that they do because the instructor that I study with, Carl Ganas, has done workshops there. So, um, he's done courses there online. So that's something that you can do, at least to study work, to study figure drawing online. 
But um, I'll tell you, if you can talk friends into posing for you, friends or family, you don't necessarily have to have people posing nude. If they're comfortable posing in their um, in boxers or underwear or bikini or bathing suit, or if they just want to pose fully fully clothed, that's fine too. It's easier to learn figure drawing if they are wearing tight fitting clothes. And the reason for that is, uh, oh, I see American Swordfish just popped in. Hey, how you doing? Um, no, nah, I'm just early in the, uh, the stream. We just got started about 15 minutes ago. Um, but getting friends and family to pose for you, the reason why it is useful to study the nude figure is because when you are drawing clothing, you kind of need to understand what the figure is doing underneath it so you can understand what the clothing does. For instance, if you're looking at someone's bent knee and you're drawing just, say here's the pelvis, here's the leg, here's the foot. So you're, it's a profile view. Let's see, that's the pelvis. So if you're drawing this and you get a sense of where the muscles are, like if you're looking at someone nude and you're like, oh, the calf sort of bulges out a little bit. If you get the sense that there's a bulge here and then the muscle, because the muscle gets narrower but it, as it comes down from the pelvis, but then it gathers up a little bit when, there's a, when the muscle turns. When the, uh, well, there's a muscle that kind of goes down and wraps around the knee and where that turn happens, it thickens. And the more that this is compressed, like if the knee is pressed up against like you're kneeling, the thicker this, uh, this area gets. But then it kind of narrows out and then thickens again. It's really subtle and quick. There's a lot of bunching up here. But if you understand what the muscles are doing underneath, then when you draw a figure who takes the same pose, you understand that if you see that there's a, a wrinkle right here, a fold, not a wrinkle, if you see a wrinkle, a crease, you'll realize that that crease is because the fabric of the pants is changing direction. The pants are going right up to where the hips join, the, where the legs join the hips, and then you'll see that there is a different shape as the pants kind of go around the leg. You'll see that there's a seam, you know, like how jeans have that seam that runs along the side, or most pants do. You can follow that seam and see, oh wait, it is going and folding down and in. Then it kind of goes along the shape of this, this outer leg. You can draw the way that the fabric will kind of pinch in underneath the knee, and then it'll kind of drape down. But as it's draping down, there's a, the shape of the rest of the leg and the cap, it kind of will fold around that. So it is important to draw the nude figure and to understand what the muscles are doing underneath because if you understand why there are folds where there are in clothing, then like if you understand what the, the anatomy, the body is doing to cause those folds, then you can use those folds to describe the anatomy. So it's not like, oh, it's hiding what I'm trying to see. The folds, in clothing almost become like another set of muscles or another set of skin where it has its own way of describing what the body is doing but it can help you in describing the form it's not so much if someone's wearing like a cloak or a large flowy dress there you kind of have to have a more intuitive understanding of what the figure should be doing underneath and then have the folds drape out appropriately from there but that in itself is a, it, it's a necessary thing that you need to understand before you're gonna go into to fig, to drawing clothes figures. So let's see, a couple more people on here. Khalid, or Khalil, sorry to say, sorry, I butchered your name. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on here, thanks for stopping by. Iron Rocks, always good to see you. So yeah, I have drifted away a little bit. Um, for those that came in late, We'll put this drawing up there, or off to the side. I'll come back to it later. So I wanted to sit down and take some drawings from figure drawing class that did not come out well. 
and do some studies to sort of break down what I did wrong, kind of analyze the, uh, the drawing mistakes. Let's see here. Give me a second, because I'm trying to pull up the chat on my live stream so I don't have to keep, I mean on my iPad, so I don't have to keep looking up at my phone while I'm doing this. All right, that seems to be working. Okay, so Khalil, I see you've got some questions. When doing these figures, do I always have perspective in mind? Um, do you think in box and form shapes always? Well, I try to. Now, I've seen uh, an online video of Kim Jong-Yi explaining his drawing process and when he's drawing, he, in his mind, he doesn't draw them on the paper, but he'll have all these elaborate compositions. And in those compositions, he'll have like one figure, like mentally he's kind of planning out the box of how much space that figure takes up. Then he'll have another figure maybe leaping behind that figure and he'll figure out what the perspective is or maybe this is more of a side view like that maybe the whole box will have it curving a little bit or have it like two boxes like it's the pelvis and the upper torso someone leaping behind and then maybe he's got a tiger coming out from behind that person so this is what I have seen or what I've taken away from watching videos where Kim Jong Yi has explained his process So he'll kind of see all of these boxes of the composition and there will be dozens of them because he'll do like an entire mural sized composition across an entire wall, you know, or just a really huge sheet of paper, multiple sheets of paper tacked together. So when I am doing figure drawing, oh, I see that was funny. You were thinking of Kim Jong-Yi. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, if you're talking about doing figure drawing and, and working out perspective and proportion, because he does also these really cool fisheye lenses, you're, you know, you're familiar with his work, um, where he really gets a sense of, of perspective in his drawings. When I am figure drawing, I'm usually not thinking to the degree of where is my horizon line. I am aware that wherever a model is, for the most part, when I sit down in class, I'll draw a little uh, demo for you. So let's say I sit down in class and I sit down in the front row. If I sit down in the front row, that's me. Here's my butt. And here I am with my drawing board. Now the horizon line is going through my eye. True, your horizon line will be wherever you're looking, but generally it's going through my eye. The model stand is raised off of the ground so that people in the back row or in further back rows can still see the model clearly. So let's say the stand probably is maybe about at my seated height. So let's say this is the ground plane that the model will be standing on in front of me. That way people that are behind can see the model's legs so let's say the model is standing there, already going off of the page. But from my perspective, usually the horizon is somewhere around the knees or somewhere in the mid thigh, depending on the height of the model, whether it's male or female. But most of what I'm drawing is looking up at the, uh, at the model. Now I say all of that so that when I show you from my point of view, when I'm drawing a model, what I start with is how big am I, am I going to make this drawing? That's the first thing. This simple line is supposed to represent the entire figure. Now, if I know that the midpoint of the figure 
is the base of the pelvis, then let's say that I've got, if the pelvis is tipped up, then maybe I'll tip this line so that I've got one leg going up that way, one leg going that way, you know, the, the hip down a little bit. Let's change this now so we'll have a little bit of a twisting of the figure, have the, uh, the opposing shoulder, like the hip that's up, the shoulder, have that come down, then have the other shoulder up, have the hip down, hand on there. Now at this point, I have not started really bringing in perspective in boxes like you were asking about. At this point, I'm still just, this is my just my gesture drawing. I'm working really on just trying to get my proportions in check. Because as I have said before, and you saw even from the, the little demo that I did earlier, the minute I stop paying attention to proportions, it goes all wonky. So this is the point where I start worrying about perspective. Now, in this sense, I'm not thinking my horizon line is here. All I'm thinking about is from, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. There are people who put the horizon line with every figure and they construct everything kind of like Kim Jong-Yi with, with boxes and building in. I mean, I use boxes too, but I'm not specifically thinking about building everything directly off of this horizon line in perspective. What I am thinking about is that this pelvis is, I'll block it in with a box. It is turned away from me so that this is the side and put a center line in here and now here's the thing instead of exaggerating or tilting this pelvis down towards me more what I do is I'm thinking about how does this pelvis look to me in space now, put a little slight underwear marks in there for where the legs are gonna go in. The way that this cube, the way I've drawn this pelvis so far, I've drawn it like a cube where you're looking at a front plane, and you can see a side plane, but you're not seeing the top or the bottom. Now, normally you would say, all right, that would be a side-on cube that you're looking at. But the fact that you're not seeing the pelvis tip down, yet it's above you, normally you would be seeing the underside of this because your eye is down here, you're below the horizon. If you're just looking at a cube that's level and that cube is also level, this is a really bad sketch right there. But what I'm trying to show is that if this cube is just a little bit above you, that's probably too much right there. If this cube is a little bit above you, you're going to be seeing the underside. So the fact that I didn't draw the underside in here, in my mind, what that indicates is that this cube is tilted down. So instead of it facing what would be considered forward, completely level, this cube is facing directly towards me, but me is down here, my horizon line. So when you talk about, or when you ask about drawing the um, drawing cubes in perspective, I'm thinking about that. I am thinking about it, but I'm thinking of it in a relative sense. Like, it's all relative to the fact that I am sitting here in this position looking up at that figure. So I try to draw in a sense that I'm not trying to imagine what it would look like, look like if I'm looking at it straight forward. I'm trying to draw it from what it looks like from this perspective. Now, with the upper torso, that's significantly farther above us. And usually the upper torso, unless the person's leaning over, at our resting state, it tends to lean back a little bit. So you would really see a lot of this underside. Um, if they were bent backwards, it would almost become something 
like where you're this plane up top, we'd really be getting a, a shallow view of it. We'd really be looking at it like at a flat plane like that. And you're mostly seeing like the abs kind of bent down underneath it. I mean, that's one of the challenges with the rib cage is that we don't see the underside of the rib cage because the underside of the rib cage is inside the body. So you kind of have to x-ray the, the figure with your mind. Um, if you've ever heard the expression drawing through the figure, that's what they mean when they say drawing through the figure. It means you have to imagine not just what you see in front, but what's the back side of the figure, what's going on internally. You kind of have to imagine it as a, almost as if you're drawing a person that's a glass cube. You have to be able to sort of turn your x-ray specs on and off. Um, you talk about this, uh, this upper arm. Now in real, in reality, if I'm doing a figure drawing, I would make this much lighter, this arc there kind of, I'm just doing this to sort of indicate that it's, a cylinder with the bottom, a cylinder that's facing away from us. We're seeing the bottom of that cylinder. So I'm just making that arc stronger so you can see it. Realistically, I would draw that much lighter so like it wouldn't interfere with the anatomical forms of the elbow that I would put on there. I've got the other arm that's dropped away and it's coming down, but it's coming down at a much more shallow angle. So by the time you get close to the horizon, you're almost just looking at the hand at a, almost a, just a regular profile. You're not really looking at it. You're looking at it more like this as opposed to looking down at the arm. Let's see here. Some more comments. Well, I see all kinds of folks. You know, people in the, in the chat are hanging out, you know, giving people some love. Marco808, good to see you. All right, um, and thanks for popping in from Hawaii. Hope you're uh, having a good time over there. Let's see. Yes, the boxes do help with the, uh, the shadow on lighting because you can very clearly decide what side of a figure is in light or in shadow. Let me see. This is a little bit weird because I've got two lights on, but let's say that I turn one light off, boom. Now it's very clear that you can kind of see this is one plane. Because this is rounded, it doesn't turn to a sharp turn like it's dark. It's a, it's a half tone. But really, notice the fact that you can see this plane is dark, this plane is dark, this whole side of the face is dark. This front, it's almost as if everything that turns the hard corner just very much becomes dark. The stuff that seems to softly turn, like up here, that should also tell you that this doesn't make a the hard turn. The difference between the forehead versus the side plane, it's rounded. There's a large half tone of this area gradually turning. Um, you can dramatize that and make this edge sharper to make it stand out more. But, you know, you can kind of clearly see now that you're looking at it straight on, there's a side getting light, and then there's a side turned away. Now it's all of the planes facing this way are all dark. So you're still getting light from the ones that are straight on, but once you turn that corner, you can see the corners a lot more directly if you're looking at, looking at it this way. You can see where this form turns from facing that way to that way. This would be the shadow, the boxes that we're talking about constructing it, this would be sort of the edge of this box, and this is the box, the side of the box. Now mind you, because the cheekbones go out a little bit and then back, that's why you're able to actually see some of this instead of it just going just pure blackness. You're actually seeing, oh, well there's still more surface here, but it's dark surface because it's facing away, it's turned the corner. Let's see here. Marco808 saying, I like to draw, I draw my boxes and pelvis like twice that. I like to draw my female figures big and healthy, just like I like them. Hawaiian iron standards. Them, yeah, them, them sexy Samoan babes. I, I feel you. Um, and by the way, there are no, um, I, I don't mind anyone jumping in with questions at different times. I tend to jump around as I talk. 
Now that's more of a, a fault of mine that I'm rather scattershot. Like as soon as I see something, I'll be in the middle of answering one question, I see a thought and I'll pop in and my mind starts jumping on that. So blame me, I'm nutty professor over here. But um, you know, that's actually a good question because when I go to figure drawing classes, we do tend to have models of all different body sizes, old and young, male, female, muscular versus athletic versus um, heavy set or curvy. And the idea is that, let's say our skeletons for the most part are all the same. So let's say you've got someone standing, you know what, let me get a fresh sheet of paper here. And let me see if there's any of my figure drawings that I was gonna work on that would be useful. Yeah, here we go. Just so you know, we're never gonna get to me drawing that skull. <laughs> um, I jump around a lot. Let's say, let's say this pose right here with the woman holding her arm out and reaching back. Let's see. Now, if you've got the skeleton, let's say, the entire torso, pelvis, rib cage, arm out, one arm kind of down and then up again, head, lolling back. One leg coming forward. One leg back. There's a lot of contrapposto here. Let's bring this in a little bit more, the rib cage, so that the, uh, the back can be twisting out a little bit. probably made the rib cage a little too wide up top, so let's narrow that a little bit. Now the reason why I'm showing you this is because this is not a skeleton drawing, but it's me indicating what the skeleton is doing. This is just, again, talking about gesture, this is actually realistically what I tend to do when I'm doing my gesture drawings. It's about this much. And then from here, like I'll start trying to work out, like I'll start trying to troubleshoot my perspective, not my perspective, my proportion from here and there. Because a lot of times at this stage, when I'm just focusing on the energy of what the model's doing and getting the flow, I'll, I'll butcher a lot of proportion. Things will be wonky. Um, now, once you've got this, in theory, imagine that there's a, well, not imagine, I'll just draw it in. So here's a very simple skeleton pelvis. I'm just gonna indicate the bones that are underneath the surface. Now, once you've got that, this could be any type of body shape. Let's say, now you're gonna lose some of the, the thickness of a, a curvy girl because of the fact that I'm not really showing her, like you're looking at a profile view of the hips and I think you really get that, that sense the best when you're looking at a, a front on view. But let's say that we now have the legs coming out thicker and you've got them coming up let's move the the buttocks out a little bit more Sorry, I had to turn around. I thought that my cat was chewing on some drawings that were on the floor. Um, some calves that come up like that. Just have a rounded tummy. Still have her waist come in a little bit, but then have her shoulders come out. Continue those curves in the back leg. And what I'm getting at with this drawing, as you can see, 
is that whether someone has a slender build or a curvy build, that the skeleton is the same. How much muscle or flesh there is around it that can really you know that's really interchangeable that's a person to person thing we're all built differently but in in fact that's a great exercise and that's the reason why I started doing this is because it's something that I don't do enough which is to go in and take the same first off if her breasts were really this large, there would be more rounding here. It's really gonna have to be rounding around the rib cage. So I'm gonna have to flatten this out. Not flatten this out, but as opposed to it being more spherical, I've gotta let it... This is real tricky. And she's gonna have to have a lot more torso to support that. Actually, the fact of the matter is that if she's that curvy, odds are there's probably going to be a wide spacing in here and gravity's just going to pull that breast over and down. That's probably what more is more realistically going to happen. So trying to keep them both sort of facing the same plane. When you have breasts that are, that are large like that, they're probably going to move in different directions if one is turned in such a way like having her form turned to this side you're gonna see gravity pull down on it more and just it's gonna run away off to the side as opposed to staying more upright and facing more towards the front to pull her head in a little bit more because that neck just does not feel right to me so I would recommend trying that taking a pose maybe it's a pose out of your sketchbook maybe you're drawing something from an anatomy book but trying to ugh butchering this shoulder see this is the reason why I need to do these things because if I'm not if I only go to figure drawing class and then go on about my day and work on comics I don't think I refine my sense of form and anatomy as much as I do when I when I do what I'm doing right now you know working on it outside of class sitting down and really taking the time to think about why I drew what I did What's wrong with it? Um, how can I strengthen my understandings of these anatomical or volumetric concepts? What are the things that I just have wrong? Because I've been drawing for most of my life and there's still stuff that I have to learn about the fundamentals. There's still stuff that I don't do well. And there are some people that are talented, like they have a natural innate feel for the figure for form, for gesture, or for volume. Um, I'm not one of those people. I have to work every day for every good drawing. It's not like, oh, he just draws really well. No, I, I, I really, this is what putting the work in, is trying to understand what you do wrong and how to do it better. Um, so, That's just an idea. In comparison to this figure, and that's not even me really pushing it, but I was kind of trying to say, you know, can I keep the same sense of gesture, the playfulness that this figure has while having her be more of a curvy plus size figure? Um, and I think that I, or at least I hope, I captured that. So, yeah, go ahead, take some of your drawings and just, redraw them with different body types. If you're used to drawing skinny, you know, rail thin people, try drawing someone curvy or maybe drawing a muscular beefy character. If you're used to drawing like superheroes that are really bulky, 
maybe try drawing a kind of a thin waif character or doing someone who's, who's curvy. You know, experiment with all these things because the skeleton underneath, as you saw me build this figure, is the same. The gesture is the same. But who they are can widely vary. Um, if you have somebody who's really lean and really tall, like their actual form is stretched out, their proportions are different, that's something where at the gesture stage, you need to plan for that. Like, um, let's see. Actually, I'll draw something like that next in a second. Let me check the chat real quick, because I got caught up. So let's see here. <laughs> American swordfish. I see that, Mark. Are you talking about, that's wifey right there. <laughs> You guys are killing me. Thank you so much. You're making my afternoon. Um, I see John Odom saying, yeah, I don't do this when I do gesture drawing. Um, well, give it a shot. You know, try it. See, see if it affects your drawings better. Um, see if it makes you think about how you draw better. Because a lot of times when you try something that's new and that's different, it doesn't come out well. Like, I'll tell you, I... Part of the reason why I feel like I have so much catching up to do in terms of figure drawing is because when I got out of school, the fine art program I went to was not focused on illustration and naturalistic rendering. They were more about conceptual art and art galleries, and it taught me a lot about creativity. But it wasn't until I got out of school and then started taking like other additional programs and classes in animation, I was like, oh wow, I really don't know how to draw. And when I started taking figure drawing classes, I would do it every once in a while, and I hated how my figure drawings came out. I always enjoyed what came out of my head better than what I imagined I enjoyed more than what I drew when I was looking at figures. And what I learned is that, well, of course, it's because I haven't been practicing it. Anytime you start something new, you're gonna suck at it. Um, and it took me years of trying to get back into it and learning to just grapple with the fact that my drawings aren't always gonna come out well but try to learn and try to grow from it. Whenever you try something new, don't let, don't let the fact that the results aren't good stop you from pursuing it. If your end goal is to have better gesture drawings or to have bigger drawings that have more structure, more volume to them, ride out the crappy drawings. Look at them and say, all right, well, what can I learn from these crappy drawings? I'm saving my crappy drawings from class to show to you, to show you what I'm trying to learn from the crappy drawings. At a certain point, you stop beating up on yourself and feeling negative about bad drawings, and then you just become curious. And when you become curious, that's when the magic starts to happen. That's when you hit hot fire. Because then it's no longer about judgment and trying to live up to expectations. It's just about what can I learn? And when you get hungry to learn, that's when the magic happens. Um, Delijah from Down Under, thank you for, uh, for popping in. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad. You know what? You rock. And I hope that you have a chance to watch the, uh, the replay of the stream and enjoy it later. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. So I'd start talking about proportions a little bit. And let's say that you've got someone. I tend to stick with uh, the classic eight figures, uh, eight figures tall, eight heads tall figure. I should probably draw this a little larger just so I have room to draw in there. So if you were to divide this into eight equal parts, the midpoint is the line between the upper body, body and the lower body. Divide that in half, divide that in half, divide that in half, 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 half. All right, so this is a normal, traditional eight head figure. So you've got your head at the top. Now the shoulder blades are a little bit below Let's say the, the rib cage is a little bit below. You're gonna draw your rib cage. Usually the uh, the halfway point goes across the nipples, but that's you know it's a little bit arbitrary. That can change depending on your body. You go down, draw the pelvis. Now 
you go down to the knees. The knees are at that halfway point. There's not really anything going on. There's not a landmark at the halfway point of these, but there's a landmark down here, the legs. Then you go down to the feet. Shoulders out here. Usually the wrists are browned the base of the pelvis and then the hands go down a little bit below that so that is a figure that's eight heads tall now let's say that you want to have somebody who is let's say they're particularly short let's say Eight, seven, well, let's just go down. Let's go down to six heads tall. Someone petite, a six head tall figure. So you would keep that head about the same. Um, if it's a child, which usually if you get below six heads, you're probably talking about someone with childlike proportions. But, you know, there are adults that tend to be like, you know, five feet, under five feet tall. Um, you know, women that are short, men that are, are short, petite. Um, but generally, if you're going to, you can keep the normal head size if you're going around, you know, six heads tall. But if you're getting lower than that, then you're probably also taking into account that the heads might be smaller. Now, when you're doing with a six head figure, six head tall figure, you kind of want to take into account that your head, the bottom of the pelvis, and then you're going to, from here, figure the rib cage. It's going to be about in the same place. Pelvis is going to be about in the same place. And then with the legs, you might go deviate from dividing this into thirds because still in general, halfway down the leg is the kneecap. And then halfway down from that is where the feet will be. So you might go off of the measurements that a figure would normally have. But point being is that you can have different body types and you can deviate from that eight heads tall You know, you can make somebody that's nine heads tall and they're either like massive, like super muscular, or they're really tall, thin, like an elven look to them. So you can change a lot of that up. All right, I gotta be careful not to get too close to the edge of the paper. I realize I just happened to look and be like, oh crap. Let's see here. Oh, Antillion Freeze. Thank you for popping by. It's good to see you. All right. Um, so drawing, you know what? I'm going to call an audible and I'm going to change plans. If I have time after I, I get into this, then I'll come back and I'll draw that um, the head that I was planning to rework. But I thought it would be useful since... Let's see who was it earlier asking about uh... oh yeah when Sonic Girl earlier was asking about tools for figure for drawing if you can't make it to figure drawing classes um, so I mentioned using the the crocus cafe videos and looking online for other videos of models to draw from but I'm gonna grab one of my anatomy books and show you how I would do a study from that book if I were doing it. Okay, so 
This book, The Figure, by Walt Reed. This one is a, uh, it is a, it says it's the classic approach to drawing construction. It is a, a classic figure drawing book. So if you're looking for resources to study a lot of these concepts in depth, this book is fantastic for it. So let me go in here and try and find a full body pose and I'll show you how I would study it. Let's see here. It's a really small drawing of a figure right there. Let me see if I can find a larger full figure just so you guys can get a, a good sense. This book really does have a lot of great drawings and a lot of, you know, great photos um, for additional reference because a lot of times some of the challenges is that the things that we see in figure drawing books don't look exactly like what we would see in real life. And that's because the artist who has drawn it has done some of the conceptualization for us and broken it down into simple concepts. So let's see here. All right. Here we go. Drawing the figure in balance. All right, let's see here. So let's take, say, this drawing of her posed on one foot. All right, so something that um, my figure drawing instructor I studied with, Carl Ganas, he's mentioned that he doesn't recommend drawing from photos unless you're an experienced draftsman. And the reason for that is because drawings, photo, photographs, the camera has one eye, whereas we have two eyes. When we're looking at an image, we're seeing a stereoscopic view. We're kind of seeing a little bit around the figure in ways that the camera cannot. So when you look at a photograph, that photograph is not truly depicting reality. It's a little bit flattened out. There's not as much volume. There's not as much, you know, it may get flat detail. Like it's getting sort of detail in the sense of it's accounting for edges and shapes but it isn't necessarily giving a full accounting of volume. Once you understand that, though, you can kind of take into account for that and just try to make your drawings feel as volumetric as possible. I'm not saying that I'm an accomplished draftsman. I'm saying that I'm aware of the issues that he's described, and I try to take those into account because I understand why he's telling people, don't just copy from books. Because what happens, you end up getting people who can make something that has all of the edges in the right place, so it has the shapes of the photograph, but it feels dead and it feels flat. And that's not what he's trying to teach. He's trying to teach you to understand the volume and to breathe life into the figure. So anyway, here we go, breaking the rules. This is, and the reason why I'm doing this is because if you go out and you get a good anatomy book, it should have more than just bones and muscles. It should have it, shouldn't, it doesn't necessarily have to have photos per se, but you know, a lot of the anatomy books I have have photos to go along with and supplement the anatomical detail. And you can use those photos to study from, just like you would use a figure drawing pose from a model I was taking in a class. So let's say I'm working on this figure and I'm drawing much lighter here, so you're probably not going to see as much until I get a little bit further in. I'll try to moderate it because I am heavy handed and I make it a point to try and draw lighter, which is awkward because I have to draw dark enough for you guys to see when at the same time I'm trying to fight the fact that I draw too dark. So I'm kind of like fighting two different battles at once. But anyway, 
I'm trying to just block in the pelvis. You know, the hips kind of curve in, and then the torso, the upper torso is rib cage is going out and away from us. This arm is dropping down. That foot is coming across. We're actually back to boxes again. This is sort of turned away from us. Not sort of. Now if you actually look at the shadow, in this side you can really see that we're looking at a box that's turned to the side. But the reason why we're getting these interesting shapes is because there's a soft turn, so it doesn't abruptly turn. The, the buttocks are rounded. So there's a soft turn away from us in that sense. And then when you go over here, on the other side, it's softly turning away. So it's not like there's just an edge here. You, there, you get to see a large portion of the figure that's in shadow because it's turned away from us, but it's still visible. It's just, it's turning away. You know, the whole area is sort of rounded. So you're kind of seeing both a box concept and a ball concept, a spherical concept at the same time. I'm getting a little bit too caught up. I probably shouldn't be drawing shadows in this early because I'm still, I haven't even finished putting in like the, the limbs and the head yet. So we've got her feet kind of going that way. Arm out here balancing her. So one of the things I've been doing more and more often now is trying to find a place like where the arm, this isn't really where the arm joins the torso because the whole shoulder is up there. And that is the actual joining area, the part of the, uh, the shoulder blades and the deltoids, the shoulder muscle, that's really where it joins the rib cage. But looking at the place where this meets, I will try to look down through the figure and see, well, where does that meet down here? It doesn't meet sort of at, it doesn't meet at the lowest point of the buttocks, but it's just in from that. So I will kind of make a note of things like that so that I can kind of come up and put a soft line up here and then just go out that way. And the arm going kind of out perpendicular to us and then jutting directly away from us. With the hand coming out. Put that shoulder up there. And get her. Let's see. The center of the neck seems to be almost as far as where the hip starts cutting out. So let's say I may have twisted her body over too much. And in fact, you can see at this diagram, that's not as extreme as the twist that I put in there. So these are the kind of corrective things that I try to look for. Instead of just saying, oh, this drawing sucks, I'm getting pissed. I just try to look and see what's wrong. I, you know. If a doctor just looked at someone and said, oh, they're, they're sick, this sucks, then their patients would die. They diagnose their patients. They look at them and say, well, what's wrong with them? Well, let's try this to make them better. They're not responding to that. Let's try this. These are all the ways that we have to understand, you know, human medicine. So let's run through all the things that we know that should work. That's kind of what you have to do with figure drawing. A lot of the stuff that you learn in figure drawing class or in drawing books are about problem solving. If you don't like problem solving, then maybe figure drawing isn't for you because a lot of it is problem solving. It's not just capturing beauty. You are trying to capture beauty, but there's a process to it. Well, what it is is you try to capture beauty and it eludes you. And you're like, well, why did it elude me? Is it because the proportion's off? Is it because my composition is bad? Is it because I don't understand 
volume or perspective so everything looks wonky. There's all kinds of reasons why it can be wrong and that's when the problem solving begins. And hopefully if you solve the problems properly, you will get a drawing that is both well drawn, well executed, and beautiful. Now, again, looking at this figure, I would actually guess that the camera, well, realistically, the camera, the, the, the way that the frame, it depends on how this image was cropped, but it looks like, generally speaking, in a camera, the horizon line is the dead center of the image. So the horizon line would be just below the buttocks. Now, that looks like it's about right to me because as I'm drawing this, I look down and I see that the curving away doesn't really begin in the legs until you get down a little bit lower into the calf, into the calves. When I say curving away, I mean it going from a flat cylinder to a rounded cylinder. Whereas if you move halfway up, the curve is less extreme, up here less, until finally it's a flat line at the top. If that makes sense to you. Yeah. So this goes back to the conversation earlier about drawing in boxes and understanding the, uh, the volume of the form that you're building. Now, see, this is already a drawing that I could very easily redraw several times because I don't feel like I got the sense of gesture in her torso, particularly in her, well, her rib cage, getting that, that sense of how it's curving over. Like, her body in the picture looks more playful, like she's kind of hopscotching, and it looks definitely much stiffer in my drawing. So these are the kind of things that I try to look at, understand, and figure out how to capture in other drawings or in redrawing this type of picture over and over again. I don't know if that's just a, a cloth that she's using to hold against her foot or wrap it around. I don't know what, what's going on with that there, but the, the cloth that's in the photograph. But um, I'm not really going to pay it any mind. I'm just going to block in her foot here. So that is how I would study a drawing from a book if I couldn't go to a figure drawing class, if I didn't have access to it. Um, I think that one should always strive to get in front of the model. Something that you can also consider, which I haven't had to do before, but if I were ever to like move out of LA and move to someplace I don't want to say more rural, but a less less of a metropolitan area. Let's say moving to another country that was tropical, which is a fantasy of my wife and mine. Um, you could always look into starting your own figure drawing group, finding out if there's models, putting an ad in a local paper, and just saying, hey, first off, trying to get a group 
a sketching group together, getting people together to meet on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis, however frequently you want to meet. And once you get artists together saying, hey, would you guys be interested in each pitching in like, you know, 15, 20 bucks or whatever, and we'll see if we can hire a model for an evening to do like three hours of poses. And you can also use like, let's say the, um, the Crocus Cafe videos that I mentioned, you can use those to kind of get ideas for what kind of poses you'd want a model to take. And if you were to hire a local model, maybe you could send them a link to the YouTube channel and kind of show them like, this is what we're looking for. This is what we're expecting, five or 10 minute poses, um, just so that they have an idea of what you're asking for. And that the model can decide whether it's something that they do or don't wanna do, whether it would fit in with them or not. Um, so that's something also to keep in mind is that I don't like to say, oh, there's just no solution so I can't do the certain thing that I need to do. I believe that with most things, if you're resourceful, you can find ways to accomplish the things you want to accomplish. And if there aren't any figure drawing classes near you, then maybe you need to start one. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, you have to learn how to be a figure drawing instructor because that's daunting. I mean, I still feel like I have much to learn and I don't know if I would feel comfortable teaching a full on class. I'm much more of interested in sharing my studies. But that's something that you could also do, look into, is, you know, getting your own group going. Let's see. We've got the art of DHT popping in on the, uh, the chats. Hi, how you doing? Hope you're having a good weekend. Um, let's see. Now that I drew this one and I am not happy with it, before going in and uh, doing that head drawing that I was gonna do, let me just take another stab at this. And something else that I did not do earlier, I think I'll mention this to you. For the longest time, I have, because proportion is one of my weak points, I always start with the figure by saying, here's how tall the figure is, and then blocking in the proportions like if this is the half point maybe they're bent over so i may have them bent over but i'll still say all right you know upper you know here's the leg other leg resting on it torso bent over hands on knees head down i would do all of that um, I was doing an exercise in figure drawing class this past week where we were doing like one minute, two minute poses. And I decided to let go of drawing that line because I want to see if I got more life in my figure just by working out the pelvis, the working out the torso, working out the upper body and lower body. So let's say for this pose that's up here, I said, what if I just start with rib cage turn this way, bottom of the rib cage turn that way, and then just trying to block in these areas And then from there, just trying to keep the other body parts in proportion. Can I tell you, I went out of proportion because I saw where the hip should be and I immediately drew the leg starting much farther out from that. But let's say that the leg was in from here. You know, and my idea was that hopefully I would get drawings that would feel a little bit more dynamic and lifelike. Like my drawings were coming out stiff at the, well, I was getting proportion at the expense of a drawing that was, was stiff and stagnant. Kind of like the whole thing about drawing, um, drawing from photos, as I mentioned earlier. So I was saying, well, what happens if I let go of a crutch I've been using for a very long time that's been keeping my drawings relatively in proportion 
and just start trying to learn how to create proportion or how to, to keep proportion without starting the figure in that off of that line. So that's something that I'm just now starting to get back into. And it's probably gonna lead to some really wonky looking proportion. But I think that in the long run, I'm ready to take those training wheels off and just see what happens. And just for, really it's about forcing myself to develop a better sense of proportion. Um, by not using the, I always thought for the longest time that if I did this measuring line long enough, I would eventually develop the sense of proportion that I was hoping to have, that it would just naturally grow. But I don't think it has been. I think that I've just continued mentally to rely on that crunch, crutch, and my figures have come out with the proportions that they have if I, I work on it and then if I don't, if the proportions that I have based on that, that tool, and then if they don't, then they're just wonky drawings. So now I think I'm gonna make a conscious effort to let go of that tool and try to fix the wonkiness and the proportions as they come. So that's gonna be an ongoing development that I'm struggling with. But just in looking at this drawing, I realized I was about to start explaining what I just explained to you. And I thought, well, let me just draw it the way that I've been doing it so I can get into the drawing and not slow down my, my discussion. Because I don't think I could discuss it while I was drawing that one, at least in terms of what I was trying to explain, you know, studying the figure, but in terms of studying the figure from a photo, but in seeing how that one came out and how stiff it felt and, and lifeless, I realized that, yeah, I'm not, I'm seeing things in my drawing, problems that I wasn't seeing before. And I think it's because my, as my artistic abilities develop, things that, problems that were always there, but just didn't jump out at me are starting to jump out more. And that's a good thing because it means that it's, it's part of the leveling up process. When you are able to see problems that you didn't see before, on one hand, it's frustrating because you're like, wow, I didn't think my art was this crappy. But on the other hand, it's like, no, I am improving my sense of perception. So again, my whole thing is I try not to beat up on myself when things don't look good. I just try to say, well, what can be better? And in this case, in this drawing, what could be better was if it wasn't so damn stiff. And as you can see, just the fact of me going back and redrawing this again, these are the kind of benefits that the entire exercise, the entire thing of me taking my bad figure drawings and redrawing them, this is what the benefit is. The benefit is you try something, it doesn't come out well, and you're like, well, I'm gonna draw something different, or I'm gonna try and solve that problem, but on a different drawing. Instead, you just simply say, all right, well, what did I do wrong? Let me see if I can fix that. And literally try to fix it with the same pose. And then if that, what you try doesn't work, trying something else. Going and pulling out figure drawing books and anatomy books and studying the problem, looking at what are the other solutions and the way that people approach these problems. This isn't an overnight process. It's a lifelong process. And it's a lifelong process that I love. I, that's what keeps me at it and keeps me working at it. People often say, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm really diligent or I'm really focused and hardworking. It's the fact that I'm doing something that makes me happy. Drawing makes me happy. That does not mean it's easy. It's very, very difficult. But you know what? Um, my wife and I don't have any kids, but we have lots of friends that do. And they love the hell out of their kids. It's very difficult being a parent um, just from talking to them and hearing all the struggles that they go through and the day to day and the lack of sleep and the way their kids can frustrate them and drive them crazy. Um, I'm not saying that art is akin to having a child, but I'm saying that things that are very difficult can be very rewarding. So this isn't an overnight process. It's not meant to be, to be easy but it is very rewarding to me and that's why I stick with it and that's why I study 
I, that's why I said, when I was about to say that's why I study so much, but I feel like that's a misnomer because I don't feel like I study anywhere near as much as I should. I feel like as much time as I spend doing my comics on a daily basis, I should be spending at least an hour a day studying anatomy and just doing drawing studies, but I don't have time to do both. So that is my cross to bear, but I still try to make time, like with you guys. See, I'm much happier with how this one came out. And it is not a photorealistic representation of that. She's still bending away from you a little bit more in the photo than I have here. But I'm definitely happier with the volumes and the sense of life in this. I didn't really capture the direction in the arm because this arm is doing an interesting thing in that it's kind of coming almost profile but slightly back towards the viewer towards us as it comes down and then makes that hard turn away so it's sort of coming just very slight like i'm rounding the edge of that arrow because it's not it's not this it's almost a side arrow but it's just slightly turned. So it's not that, it's not that, it's just slightly turned. And then it makes a hard turn away from us. So these are the kind of things that I'm trying to under, not just understand, but trying to depict. And what I mean is there's a lot of things, from taking figure drawing classes for a number of years, there's a lot of things in my head that I understand conceptually. But understanding the idea of it is not the same as being able to do it. And that's the next level challenge that I'm trying to develop personally, is how to not just be able to explain to you that the arm is coming towards us and then curving hard, hard away, but that it's a really subtle towards us, but to be able to draw, the, draw it in such a way that it's evident that you don't even have to ask the question, well, is that a full profile or is it, which direction is it going? To be able to convey that, and that involves anatomy, it involves tone, it involves a better sense of, of perspective and proportion. There's a lot of things that have to happen in order to make those, to draw something that convincingly describes those things. So we've been going on for 80 odd minutes now. Um, let me see, on the chat real quick. Um, American Swordfish, you're popping in there. Do I also try different ages, different races? Um, Asians are hard uh, to draw. Um, let's see, as a matter of fact, I don't do it as often as I'd like. In Morningstar, I tried to create a cast of characters that were multi-ethnic so I could give myself practice. But there is a book, it's either just called Facial Expressions or it's called the Atlas of Facial Expressions. I can't remember which, but it is a book of just a wide variety of men and women, and it's just there. It's just tons of headshots of them. But it's also each person probably has like several pages worth of images of them doing different facial expressions: happy face, sad face, angry face, um, and from different profiles, different left, right, front, three quarter shots so that you can kind of see how different people's facial features look and are structured. And I have that book. I actually got it on Kindle so I can look at it on my phone and, uh, and do quick studies when I'm just out and about, just doing them in sketchbooks. I haven't been doing it as frequently as I should. Um, so I don't think that I'm great at drawing different ethnicities. Um, a lot of my figures look like just sort of generic generic forms like I may do cheekbones a little bit wider or noses a little bit wider only because I'm black and black people do tend to have broader noses so sometimes I will put that in in my own generic figures but as a whole in terms of actually studying um, drawing different ethnicities it is something that I should do and I have not put as much time studying it as I, as I should um, Whoops, shaking the camera there. All right, so before we wrap up, this is funny because I really don't think I'm gonna get this right, 
in like just a quick five minute drawing. But this drawing right here, that came out poorly. I'm gonna try and break down the things that I felt did not work about work in that drawing and see if I can get a better sense of how it should have gone. So let's start by building everything off of the mass of the skull, the mass of the cranium. Now, looking at this figure, we're below it. So let's say that this is sort of the, uh, the pole that runs through it, the axis of the, the head. Let's draw in the equator will be at the center at the edges, but it will go up and it basically the equator is the brow line. So let's draw around there. Let's see. Yeah, that looks about right. And the front plane of the face. Now, since we're looking at the front of the face, what we're gonna do is, if we were, if this was a profile, then the nose would be coming off of here, like the, the line that makes the center of the face would be coming off of here, and the ears would be over here, if this was a profile. Since it's not a profile, let's say that we move the center line of the face over to here. If that's the center line of the face, then let's move the ear back here, the same distance. So let's put that ear back here. Now this is where things went wrong the first time. I didn't get that underside of the jaw appropriately. Now maybe I made it too strong, too blocky. Let's pull this in a little bit. I think I may have made the jaw go down too far, not showing enough of the underside. Now see the challenge, let me grab Mr. Bones again. The challenge is that we're looking at the underside of a surface but it's not that it's just sitting flat and we look at the underside of a box. If you're looking at the face straight on, we're looking at the underside of a surface that, that is not flat. It's the underside of a surface that's also going up, meaning that it's not like you're looking here and then the jaw goes in like that. That would be a, a really extreme view if you were looking like someone with their, their head turned way, way up. Instead, what we're seeing is very subtly it comes in before the bone goes, the jawbone turns up towards the cheekbones. And I'm only lightly shading this in. Normally I wouldn't shade any of this in because this is still an early stage in it, but I kind of want to understand for myself what I did wrong in terms of conveying the underside of the, the jaw. And I'm gonna erase out a small arc in here. Because what was going on, in terms of looking at this drawing was that you've got the neck coming up but then that neck is also hidden by the shoulder. I think the model probably had a, uh, this is like I mentioned before that the model is always on that stand and I tend to sit in the front row, particularly when we're doing head studies so I can see more detail. So I was looking very much up at this model. Um, so there was a lot of overlap here in terms of shoulder, overlapping the neck. Then the other side. Now see, this is funny because I'm looking at this and I'm wondering what am I looking at on the other side? Like, 
Is that just her shoulder dipping down? Because it seems like if this shoulder's up so much, I wouldn't be seeing that much of it. But being that I'm just kind of going off of a drawing where I don't have the rest of the figure, I don't want to get too wrapped up in what's going on in terms of the neck connecting to the torso and the shoulders. I want to focus just on what were the things I did wrong volumetrically. Um, I probably had her hair go out too far, made the back of her hair too large. Um, let me not get caught up in the hair yet. Let me say, all right, here's the center line. Let's say that's the corner of the brow. See, I saw somebody pop into the chat. A couple of peoples. Namora72 popping in. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for, for stopping in. Um, I'm wrapping up a live stream here. I'm only going to be on for a few more minutes while I work on this head. But, you know, definitely check out the replay to see what you missed. And uh, I've, if you haven't seen me in a while, then I've probably got a bunch of videos since the last time you were on. Uh, Nathan Center popping in the chat. Hi, good to see you. Hope you're enjoying these. Um... I actually debated when I was sitting down whether I was going to do figure drawing or whether I was just going to work on the latest comic page that I'm doing, but I haven't done one of these figure drawing ones in a while, so I wanted to get in here because it's, it's an important part of my learning process. It's like I need to do this in order to make my comics better. So, But yeah, the next few live streams will probably be more comic related, and in fact, I think I wanted to see what would happen if I just did live streams for a month or two. Um, doesn't mean that I'm going to stop doing the time-lapse videos, but, you know, I'm always experimenting, trying different things, trying to learn, grow, see, so you're going to get more of these videos of just me in real time talking with you as I'm working. So we'll get back to the, uh, the old school time-lapse and talks eventually. So let's say that this is the brow line. That's one of my cats, Khaleesi. I don't know if you heard her. Um, you're probably looking at something close to, because uh, the brow is just sort of peeking over her nose. So I'm trying to see if I can pose this kind of like what you're, let's see here. Kind of like that. Now see, the weird thing is that from where I'm sitting, let me twist this more because from where I'm sitting, this is kind of what I'm seeing, but you're not really seeing any of the underside. But this is the odd thing is from where I sit, I can actually see a little bit of the underside plane. And plus the fact that there's going to be a little bit of the, the flesh that's under here is going to stick out a little bit more. So that's kind of the, the challenge of this pose. Um, let's see. Nathan Center, you also asked, do I have a plan when I practice? Um, when I'm done with this stream, if you have a chance to go back and, and watch it, this whole video that I've been doing is about the plan of how I study and how I practice. So this is what I'm kind of wrapping up in terms of the studies for I do when I do figure drawings. But right now, what I do is, this is a, these drawings that are over here on the left are from a figure drawing class that I've taken in the past. I try to take figure drawing classes on a weekly basis. And what I do is I look at the drawings that did not come out well. There's something that's a little bit wrong. The features are off, the anatomy is wonky, um, you know, whatever is wrong with it. And I try to take my drawings that didn't come out well and I redraw them, analyzing them, looking for what are the things that I, I need to uh, do to understand the mistakes I made. And in the process of doing that, I also brought out a, uh, a figure drawing book. I usually will have multiple figure drawing books. I have a whole bookcase behind me with a, with a variety of figure drawing books that I pull from, that I look at. Plus, I've got this particular skeleton. I also have a three foot tall, full body skeleton. I'll pull those out and look at the anatomy and try to study and understand what I'm doing wrong. So that's usually the plan is look at bad drawings and figure out what I did wrong. That is the plan of attack. Um, you also asked whether I do digital. I usually will do digital for um, for color. I tend to color my my art prints, or I do my gray tones for my comic book pages in Photoshop. Um, I don't do digital for figure drawing 
not because I have anything against digital. I am not anti-digital. However, I am in front of a computer all day for my day job. And when I come home, the last thing I want to do is sit in front of a computer longer. So I choose to do, there are a lot of benefits to working digital and doing comics. You can do a lot of, um, you can probably do your layouts faster, do a lot of revisions. I choose to do mine traditionally, specifically just because I need that break from the computer. So um, I do think digital is a great tool cool I'm not anti-digital and you should use whatever works best for you but also um, unless you've got a, a tablet you're it's hard to do digital doing figure drawing I mean well if you've got a laptop you can bring your laptop and a a um, a Wacom stylus but for the most part you're kind of uh, you kind of stuck doing traditional when you're doing figure drawing in classes. And that's something that I, I mentioned. Part of the whole point of these videos is that I'm primarily a comic book artist, but I definitely feel like I need work in terms of my anatomy, my perspective, my figure drawing. So I take figure drawing classes regularly and it's made a big difference in my comic book work over the years. Um, so, Figure drawing, that's, you know, again, it's back to this whole video, this whole stream is me going through my figure drawing work and, and doing some studies to, to figure out the things that I need to brush up on and improve and study more on. Now, I got a little bit caught up in answering that question and not necessarily talking about what I'm drawing here. So I was trying to kind of work out the same way that I was, I, in doing gesture drawing, was kind of like placing the limbs and the torso. I'm trying to sort of get the, uh, the place and the position of the nose, the mouth, the eye sockets. And I think this probably could be rounded a little bit more. I made it a little bit sharp. I gave her too much of a man's, a male eyebrow where it's kind of like a hard brow sticking out, whereas women tend to have sort of softer, more rounded brows. Now, one of the things I'm already noticing is that this figure, part of the problems I can really see is that I didn't make all of the planes coherent. Meaning that on the upper part of her body, her face is more of a profile, but yet when you get to the underside here, you're kind of like, it's flattening out a little bit more and you're seeing more of a broadside. So this drawing that I'm drawing here now one of the things I'm doing is that it's a little bit more consistent and since you can see more I've kind of compressed it a little bit more so that you've, you've got more of a frontal view of her like if I were to lightly sketch in like this that'll really kill the sense of her feeling feminine but the point is is that I'm sort of making it like this is her front plane and I'm kind of giving you that in comparison to the side plane more now it's just a light blocking in of where her hair is. Letting the hair kind of fall. From the way I drew it in there, it looks like a little bit of it was tucking behind her ear. And this ear probably is a little bit more slender than I have it here. And it should be the same way that I drew that equator going around there the bottom of the ear should line up with the base of the nose. I mean, as a generality, it's not 100%, it's not a rule written in stone, but I'm just gonna kind of lightly draw in the inner part of the ear and the ear lobe. Then, let's say her hair is coming off that way. So I'm not seeing as much of that underside. So 
So what I'm gonna do is one more drawing real quick, because we're already like 90 minutes past. Let's see here. I see American Swordfish saying, Oh yeah, Nathan Center said, uh, yeah, you're kind of the same in terms of uh, being stuck in front of a computer. Your American Sword of Fish, you're, you're anti-digital. You know what, man? You wear your, you wear your art, your art uh, positions on your sleeve. You let people know where you stand. I, I, you know what? If, you, if you're anti-digital, I, I always feel like people should use whatever tools makes them the happiest. If, you, if you're like, no digital for you, then, then rock that. I'm not hating on anybody else's creative process. Let's see here. So what I'm gonna do is I am gonna do one more quick study of this drawing and I'm gonna rotate it a little bit and I'll show you the reason why is because as I said before, I try to do a drawing, fix what's wrong and then look at what happened with my fix and see if that improved, if that helped. Um, so the big problem with this drawing, this one that I did here, aside from how manly she looks, that's not really the, the point here. Um, the problem is that we should be seeing more of the underside. And I think that that challenge of the difference between this versus this. This is a hard angle because there's so much overlap going on at a lot of different levels. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one more drawing and take her instead of like drawing her like, like the way I have it there, I'm gonna turn her away from us a little bit more and underside of her head a little bit more. And I'm just gonna see what happens. So. And this, this is really what I, I try to do when I have my, I wish I had time to do it more. I used to do it like once a week. Like I would sit down for like, you know, one or two hours, probably about as long as we're spending here. But just go and just say, all right, I drew that thing and it didn't look good. Let me try it again, it doesn't look good. And I try it again, it doesn't look good. And just try to figure out all of the things I was doing wrong. So I'm gonna start this time kind of with the facial plane out here because I'm gonna tweak the, uh, the axis. I'm, gonna I'm tilting the axis of her skull a little bit more because of me turning her away from us. So we've got that. Let's get that equator in there. Let's keep the facial plane out here this time. Then let's, I'm doing another sort of equator, but this one is more for the, uh, the lower part, for the, for the cheekbones. So let's say, let's move that ear in a little bit more. And to be honest, just moving the ear in a little bit more well, that would have fixed the whole thing of like in this one, the head feeling so damn big. It's like, well, if the ear wasn't out as far as I drew it, then maybe it would feel more naturalistic. So. Now I can already tell you I went a little bit too extreme because at this angle, you can really see both nostrils. And one of the things that was interesting with this pose was that I could see, well, I've kind of indicated a little bit of the wing of the far nostril, but it's almost like you're mostly looking at just that one nostril that's coming up at you. So for this, let's just simplify the nose. into sort of a, um, not quite a parallelogram, but it's sort of like a rectangular block. 
that's beveled so that it gets narrower at the, the, the far point and it also is taller down at the bottom than it is at the top where the bridge of the nose is. So let's kind of do that. Back to simplifying things into blocks. Yeah, Nathan Center, I think it's worth, um, if you're interested in the stuff that I'm talking about, um, when this stream is done, to go back and, I'm not sure if you'll be able to watch the replay instantly or whether it needs to process for like 15 or 20 minutes, but go back and watch the replay because I talked through a lot of the stuff that you were asking about and like kind of basically working through my entire process for how I study the figure when I'm not actually in figure drawing class. move this a little bit out and see this is where things get this is what the whole challenge is is that I'm both looking down at something and at a near but not quite profile of something and that just it screwed me up so hard because it wasn't even like oh the cheekbone is poking out on that side because so looking at this chin I see how the chin just sort of wraps around and wraps it kind of runs away from you It's just yes, yeah, so we're really getting the underside of this nostril. Oh, Vince, my buddy Vince Moore, comic, uh, comic writer slash journalist slash slash comics retail on um, slash creative raconteur of, of all of all things great and wonderful. Good to see you, Vince. Glad you, you popped in on the weekend. Let's see here. Um... Yeah, I'm just uh, doing a little uh, live stream with some figure drawing. Been answering some questions, and I'm probably going to be on for uh, finishing. Really, this head that I'm drawing here is me, like the last thing I'm wrapping up before I, before I call it a day. But uh, let's see. I saw another question in there. Um, Nathan Center asked, who is my favorite comic book artist? That's a really hard question because there's a lot of artists that I like, and they aren't necessarily all of one style. I think that um, comics is a medium of, of influences. And I think that pulling from a broad range of, re of influences gives you a broader range of style or more unique style. Um, or it could just be the fact that I'm interested in a lot of different styles. Probably because I would say at the top of my list is Bill Sienkiewicz. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, look him up. Probably try looking up um, Bill Electra Assassin because his last name is difficult to spell. Um, I am not going to try and spell it for you here because I'll just butcher it. Um, but he's an amazing artist and he's actually a really nice guy. I've got a chance to meet him at a couple of conventions through a mutual friend. Um, but the thing about Bill Sienkiewicz is that he has a very expressionistic artwork. It's almost like he's drawing the internal, not just the figure, but drawing what the figure is thinking, feeling. Like, it has a lot of painterly expressive work to it. Um, also, I like the fact that he has, he works in a lot of different mediums within a given comic book. Like, he'll have charcoal drawings with, uh, acrylic painting with airbrush, with colored pencil, with ink drawing. Like he's incredibly diverse over a large number of mediums. And because, as I mentioned, I like a lot of different artists. I kind of, when I was in high school, I struggled with the whole idea of, well, what is my style gonna be? Artists are always trying to quote unquote, find their style. And I saw in Bill Sienkiewicz that you don't have to pick. As long as your artwork has a cohesive feel to it, and that's the challenge. Not everyone can do what he does. So what he does is he brings together a lot of diverse art styles 
but he makes them work within the piece. He, he gives each, each different style or each different medium in the piece, it has a purpose to it. It speaks to the larger whole of the story. It conveys a specific emotion that a character is experiencing, or it conveys a certain mood in the narrative that's different from what's going on in the rest of the book. So there's a purpose to it. It's not like he's just saying, oh, I'm gonna paint this one thing over here and this other thing over there. Um, but beyond Bill Sienkiewicz, I would say I'm definitely influenced by Walt Simonson, um, Frank Miller, um, John Byrne. Um, there's a lot of more recent comic book artists that also influence me, um, like Ashley Wood, um, Ben Temple Smith. Like those are guys that have more of the Bill Sienkiewicz um, thing to it. Uh, Sean Gordon Murphy is an artist whose work I love. I love his inks, and I actually have to be careful how much of his work I look at because I really like his style of inking, and I I will start copying. I'll start aping his style if I look at it too much, which it sucks that I have to limit how much of his work I look at, but I kind of like every once in a while I'll read one of his books or when I'm not doing any inking at that time, I'll just go and look at it because if I start looking at his work while I'm in the middle of working, inking a comic book, I will totally start aping it. I, I love his, his style. Um, there's, um, who else? Someone whose work is very different from mine, but I really admire is Brian Stelfreeze. He's somebody who, when I first looked at his work, I thought, it, like, he's somebody who, at first you look at his work and it's extremely complex and detailed. And then what you see is that he's drawing a complete world because he doesn't draw, his style isn't over-rendered. He draws everything simply, but he draws everything. So you're looking at, if you look at a kitchen, you see all the pots and the pans and the tiles and the light switch and all that. Like he gives you everything that makes the world feel complete. So he taught me a lesson about style and economy where it's not necessarily about just drawing all kinds of, throwing the kitchen sink in there, literally. It's about making the world feel complete. Another artist is Mark Schultz. And I started studying his work because of his sense of figure drawing. Um, he draws figure drawing, like I don't have the time to put in the detail that he has. It would just take me forever to draw a comic that are as detailed as his work. But he's another artist who just kind of, he draws it like, ah, oh God, it's just, it's hard to even explain. But if you ever seen the comic book Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, I, I feel like ever since he did that book, this figure drawing work that he's been doing beyond that and covers and illustration work is even far more compelling than the stuff that I was first exposed to. But he, Mark Schultz, is another uh, great artist that I, I consider an influence. Um, let's see. So I'll tell you the wrap up on this is I tried drawing this more rounded and more turned away. I still don't feel like I accomplished what I was going for. Because I don't feel like I really got the sense of you turning and looking at the underside of this figure. Um, you're looking at more of the underside but it still doesn't feel like what was going on in this drawing. So maybe it's funny. I came in starting saying I was gonna start with this. Maybe I will save this drawing. And even though I wanna do comic, get back to comic book work the next time I do a live stream, maybe I'll save this one and come back specifically and just say, all right, I tried this a couple of times. Let me work through it a few more. Because realistically, I would end up filling this page and probably like two or three more pages trying to work out different variations of this until I figured out what was wrong. This is only like, these two drawings here are like the first step in me trying to study and break down what was wrong with this work. So, let's see here. Oh yeah, um, Let's see. Oh, okay. Everyone's coming in with some some great uh some great comments here on the the favorite artists. Well, let me scroll back. Uh, first off, Khalil, would you suggest um how to learn? <clears throat> would you suggest to learn how to hold the pencil the way I'm holding it? Well, the reason for this is because with a writer's grip, you can only draw a point. Now that doesn't mean that you can't draw lightly. And it doesn't mean you can't sketch in 
tone. But the idea of a figure drawing grip or a painter's grip is you're kind of holding it more like a paintbrush. And the idea is that you're drawing with tone. And the idea of drawing with tone is because tone is your tool for turning the form. If you draw a circle, you add tone to show where it's getting darker. And where it's getting lighter. So that is the purpose of using this, uh, this grip that I'm using, is it gives you a tool that you don't necessarily have. Because if you're just drawing with this, it's hard to make a really soft tonal drawing. Whereas if you're drawing with this, you can still make a line drawing. All you do is you lift the, um, you just lift the edge of the, uh, the pencil. Basically, when you're um, drawing with tone, you're drawing like this and you're just brushing it across and you're actually using like the whole side of the pencil. If you want to make a line, you just lift it up or you just pull straight to create a line. So there's different ways to create lines with this grip. So it gives you an additional tool. So it's the difference between drawing a box or a cube like this versus drawing one side, it's a darker tone, one side, it's a medium tone, lightly blocking in the far top edge. See, so this second box feels a lot more painterly, for lack of a better term, because it's not drawn, even though there is line in it, it's not made up of lines. It's made up of tones. And these tones describe light, or specifically describe where the light is hitting the form. So, for instance, I've got a little uh, floss box here. The way that you can tell, if I hold this at like a, uh, a three quarters angle, the way that you can tell that this is a three dimensional object is because this plane is darker than this plane, which is darker than that plane. So you can, the light is what actually tells you what's happening with the form, not line. So that's the advantage of being able to draw with tone. That's the advantage of using this grip versus this grip. And let me tell you, when I started taking figure drawing classes, I drew with this grip for about the first year. Even though um, my instructor showed us this grip and said, you're gonna have to learn to do that, I spent a year fighting it before I gave in. So don't expect to instantly just start doing it and you're like, oh, okay, I got this. You just have to embrace it and embrace that's gonna feel really awkward and then eventually you'll get used to it. Now it feels like second nature to me, but it takes time. It took a good long while. Um, there were a bunch more questions that, that rolled through. I saw Greg G Giordano hop in in the chat, and I didn't have a chance to say hi to you. Um, but we were talking great, uh, great comic, comic artists and, uh, and influences. Let me roll through. So let's see what was up here. Um, Ion Rocks mentioned Mobius. A lot of the, uh, the Euro erotic artists. Um, yeah, Milo Manara also. I've got a, one of the um, Milo Manara library that books that I think it was Dark Horse that put out. That thing's beautiful. Vince mentioned when uh, talking about uh, Sienkiewicz, the, uh, the New Mutants Demon Bear Saga, which is fantastic. I have the original issues of those, and I love that. Let's see. And yes, uh, Greg, you, yeah, that is an easy way. If people at... Um, don't have a chance to, if you're just guessing, look at the chat because Greg um, Giordano mentions sink ev itch. That's, that's a really easy way to pronounce it. Spelling it is something where I have to look it up. I always butcher his name in the spelling. But um, yeah, and Vince Moore also mentioned that Sinkevich recently started his own YouTube channel. It's got some videos on there. Um, I think I started following his channel when I saw it, but when I, I followed it as soon as he created it. So I haven't had a chance to go back and look and see what videos he's added. So when I'm done here, 
I'm probably gonna go watch some St. Cabbage, so maybe you guys should too. Um, Sepieri from uh, the, the European artist, Ion Rocks also mentioned him, which is funny. I've got a bunch of old issues of heavy metal I'm going through and all of those guys, Minero, Sepieri, uh, Mobius, are all in there. Um, and, and Greg, thank you for the, the kind words. Um, it looks like you've been influenced by doing work and learning, learning the craft. So thank you, I appreciate that. Um, the, the work never stops. I'm always trying to improve and study. And I feel like sharing that process with you, sharing that process with other people is a learning process into itself because everyone just wonders, well, how do I get better? And showing what that hard work looks like is the, um, I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't show that often. A lot of people don't, don't necessarily say, oh, well, they just tell you to study, but they don't show you what the study looks like. So I figure, why not share that process? I'm doing the work anyway, and maybe you guys will, it'll inspire you to say, wow, well, it's not as easy as I thought, but it's not as mysterious as I thought either. So that is the whole reason for me sharing that on my, uh, my channel. So uh, thank you again, Greg. I really appreciate that. Let's see. Um... Ion Rocks, when it comes to comic book work, I became a Kirby fan a few years ago. Kirby is another creator who I, I didn't appreciate him when I was in high school. Because as soon as you become interested in comics, you even start a countdown until someone says, have you checked out Kirby? Do you know Kirby? Because he's the king of comics. Um, when I was in high school, I didn't really appreciate his work. I thought it was a little bit blocky and ugly. Um, it wasn't until I got older and started studying figure drawing Two things. One is just in studying drawing more and discovering people like George Bridgman and seeing the structure and the dynamics of it, I realized that Kirby was creating dynamics that a lot of people who maybe had prettier line work weren't necessarily describing as well. Like Kirby made you feel things with his drawings. And then later on, um, much later, after I'd already really appreciated his genius in general, I went to an exhibit, um, a museum exhibit in Northridge, California, where they had a lot of Kirby originals. And that museum exhibit was just like, a lot, a lot of the reproductions that people see of Kirby's work and the reprints now, they, aren't, they weren't shot back when, the, with the digital technology we have now to capture line work in art. And looking at his originals now, they look like beautiful masterpieces, like paintings. And you can see that just the reproduction quality and the printing quality didn't capture the beauty of a lot of his earlier work. So even then, I wasn't even seeing just how beautiful a lot of his work was. So definitely check out Kirby. Um, if you can find books that are more recent reprints, or there's also, um, I believe it's the Jack Kirby Reader or I can't remember the exact name, but the people that do Tomorrow's Publishing, they have a lot of um, reprints of Kirby artwork where it's shot from his pencils or shot from art collectors' collections. You can see um, much better contemporary reprodu reproductions with contemporary production methods of his artwork and see just how great Kirby is. All right, we have gone over two hours on this stream. I think that's a new record for me. Thank you everybody that, that hung in and hung out and commented in the chats and spent time with me. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. So um, if you are not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. Uh, feel free to check out my newsletter to see everything I'm up to. It's newsletter.jeremy.net um, and that's G-E-R-I-M-I dot -I net. So that is it for now. Thank you again and go be creative.